Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence into our hearts, into our lives, and into this study. Um, we're thankful, Lord, for the work that you are doing upon this earth. And I pray that you can help us uh, to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as we share truths with others that we can reflect your character and use your methods. We pray that your Holy Spirit can work upon the hearts of those who hear us, that they can be receptive uh, to the things that we share and that the things that uh, we have learned, that they can affect a change in our lives. Uh, be with us in this study as we continue to look at Daniel chapter 11 and uh, the scriptures related to understanding uh, the time that we are in. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So, this study that we've been doing is obviously taking a little, little bit of time because there's so many different things that we have to connect. And right now, uh, we're starting to look at Xerxes. We looked at him a bit yesterday. Um, so the idea is that since Xerxes is Trump, that in order to understand our time and what relates to Trump, we need to understand the history of Xerxes. Now we have two stories in the book of Esther uh, that address Xerxes. The first in chapter one is addressing him stirring up all against the realm of Grecia. Now, it doesn't particularly tell us this in the passage. That is, if we read in Esther chapter one, we don't have laid out for us, um, uh, you know, exactly why Xerxes is having these feasts, but it's well known, right? So that he's he's bringing the the leaders of these 127 provinces, they're called princes, um, and over a period of uh, six months and seven days, he's going to, um, well, I guess it'd be six months and 10 days, depends how you count a month, but 187 days. So there's gonna be the first 180 days and then the seven days. Now, one of the things, of course, is that is 187, that's gonna give us the symbol of July 18. And also it's um, going to be the 10th day of the seventh month when Vashti comes before or is called before uh, Xerxes and his friends at this feast. Now this feast is the Akitu festival. And um, this festival begins in the spring and ends in the fall. So there's just like Passover and Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles, that they have this spring fall feast. And um, I've taken the position that since Darius um, became king on the 10th day of the seventh month, that there's some significance there in the fact that this is the 10th day of the seventh month. And um, uh, what was the other point? So, so anyway, we have this first um, part, this first story, and we can see the symbols here of midnight. So those symbols showed up in the symbol of Shushan in two different ways. And uh, what were the two different ways? So we have 7,800, 7,800. If we divide it by a prophetic year, gives us 21.7, rounded up to the nearest decimal. So it's 21.6 carried on. And of course, even 216 itself is a symbol of uh, the Sunday law in that it's, it's six times six times six. 
right? So we have these symbols of July 18th. We have the symbols of the Sunday law. We have the symbols of midnight. Um, and what was the other way that we got uh, the 127? Was that just Shushan itself, the gematria or something like that? I think that was if we took the gematria of Shushan. Right? Yeah, so that gave, no, it wasn't the gematria of Shushan. What was the other thing that gave us the one, two, seven? Oh, the 127 provinces was one. I thought there was another, another way in which that occurred. I'd have to look at the video, I guess, if you don't remember. <clears throat> so we have these symbols here in chapter one. Now, chapter two happens after um, Persia loses to Greece. So when we looked at this it, historically, um, this is going to be the third year of Xerxes. And uh, the Persian campaign against Greece uh, occurs in the year uh, 480 BC. So that's going to be the sixth year of Xerxes. And then when he gets back in the sixth year, there's going to be that one year period that we see here in Esther chapter two, right? So he gets back, he wants to get a, uh, a new wife or a new king, or a new queen, pardon me, to replace Vashti. So the king needs well, a new queen. Yeah, but Vashti, he, he removed her, so he's going to get, yeah, Esther as this. Okay, so <clears throat> now we've gone through this story, so I don't know how much detail we want to look at. Um, so he's going to appoint officers, verse 3, to gather together, together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hedge, or Hege, uh, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. Um, and let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Ashtai. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. And Shushan the palace... There was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, Mordecai, however it said, and the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So, right, so he's a, a Benjamite, but he's descended from Kish, uh, just as King Saul is, right? So we had addressed that story before. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah. Obviously, that's not referring to Mordecai, who was carried away, right? This would refer to um, uh, this Jair is the one who would have been carried away with the captivity of Jeconiah, which of his course, uh, Jehoiachin. Um, so that was in the same captivity as um, Ezekiel. Now, what would be the significance of that in, in the context of the present time? That we have Mordecai, because we, we have him here. Obviously, these are symbols, right, that we apply to our time. And what would be um, the fact that he's carried away at the same time Jehoiachin and Ezekiel are, that is, Jair is... Um, father is carried away at that time. And so Jair was probably a young child, I would assume, or fairly young. What does this tell us? So what's the significance of Jehoiachin's captivity? Uh, 
Well, it's, it's been connected to a period of 666 years. Right. So it's connected to the 666 years um, from Jehoiachin's captivity and Ezekiel counts. He's predicting the siege of Jerusalem, but ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And it's going to be 666 years from Jehoiachin's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple the second time, right? So that, so the fact that we have here a symbol, Mordecai, who's connected to the 666 years, right? So that's a symbol, of course, of 666, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's not well known, but it, it definitely is something that would, uh, it, for this movement, should be. So the 666 years, symbol of the Sunday law, is connected to Mordecai because his father was carried away at the same time that Ezekiel was. At least that's who I assume that it's referring to. Because you've got Jair, it that's his his father, and uh, Shimei would be his grandfather. Now Kish, of course, wouldn't be just that. That's someone down the line, right? And then, of course, Kish is a ben of the tribe of Benjamin. The Saul's of the tribe of Benjamin, the son of Kish. So he's he's uh, um, referring to his paternity all the way back to Benjamin, but of course through Kish, right? And we know that this conflict then between uh, Mordecai or Mordecai and um, Haman, because Haman is the descendant of Agag. So that's the one who Saul was supposed to kill, but didn't. Right. So, so we have that symbol. So if we take these as symbols, because we take them as historical facts, but we're putting them in our time in connection with understanding this story of Xerxes, what are these symbols telling us? What is this connection between um, Mordecai and Haman? And what is this connection uh, going back to the captivity of Jehoiachin? So it's referred us back to historical events. So what does this mean in this story of Esther? Oh, yeah, Stephen. Well, uh, Ezekiel, five years after that, five years, four months, and five days. Yeah. After that captivity. So he's going to be at midnight. So he's referring to that uh, event at the captivity. And so maybe you could, uh, in some way, Maybe see a connection there with midnight. Uh, okay. It's captivity. Okay. So, so because we can connect it to Ezekiel and Ezekiel starts his prophesying at midnight, right? So we're, we're just connecting Mordecai through his, his father to that captivity in which Jehoiachin is taken captive, but also Ezekiel is taken captive. And Ezekiel is going to give us this symbol of midnight. Because Ezekiel represents our history, right, from midnight to October 22nd, 1844, right? So, so one of the things about um, Ezekiel, because we always talk about Samuel Snow's letters. Samuel Snow's letters are going to point us to July 18th. Right. July 18th is a symbol of the prediction before midnight. Now, we know with Ezekiel, he's making a prediction. Now, he's making that prediction starting at midnight. So that means he he's connected with Samuel Snow. But he's he would be connected with Samuel Snow from July 21st 
to October 22nd. That is, that's the period of time symbolically that Ezekiel prophesies, just obviously as a prophecy on the first day of the first month as well. Um, because he starts prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month. The last one recorded in the book is the tenth day of the seventh month. Uh, but the last prophecy he prophesies is on the first day of the first month. And I know these are a lot of symbols to sort of pull together and try to make sense out of them. But if we look at Ezekiel and he represents our movement, our movement isn't to midnight yet. We've been dealing with what we would call the prediction before midnight. So that three days prior to midnight. And that three days shows up in the story of uh, Ezra. In three different places, you have periods of three days. Um, and then also in the story of Ezra, we have the symbol of the first day of the first month. Now, we've take this first day of the first month symbol as being um, uh, this symbol that that comes after October 22nd, 1844. That is, it's going to be 2300 lunar months after the first day of the first month in 1844. It goes to uh, April 5th, 2030. So that's, uh, what is it ever it was, 67,920 days. <clears throat> 23 lunar months. So, so we have these symbols, but we haven't really sorted out um, exactly how to place them or what they mean. All we know is that we have these symbols here and they tie this to our history. That would be, I guess, the main thing to say. But it, it ties us to this midnight symbol. It ties us to Ezekiel. It ties us uh, to his prediction about the destruction of Jerusalem. And and we haven't really talked much about the destruction of Jerusalem as a symbol at, of the end of the world, but we know it is, right? I mean, that's how the Great Controversy starts out, the book, The Great Controversy, uh, dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem and showing that the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is the type of the end of the world. So we have all of these symbols here. We have more. So we have Hadassah. Now, Hadassah's name, uh, the Hebrew number is 1919. So what is that symbol with Hadassah? Uh, 1919 Bible Conference. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, well, and, and I wouldn't take that as a primary symbol, but I would say, yeah, that, that it definitely ties to that. Um, the primary symbol of 19 for this movement would be what? 9-11. Well, you could put 9-11 in there, but the primary symbol would be the 19 years um, from uh, 742 to 723, right? Because that's the first time we really see 19. Would people agree with me on that? Yeah. Now, do we also have 19 years at the end of the 2520? Not the 2520 prophetic mirror. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we have 1919 could represent that whole prophetic mirror as a symbol. So that, so it's giving us this hint that Hadassah is a message relating to the 2520. Now we also have 19 representing the Metonic cycle, and we also have a doubling of 19, which represents midnight or the, or the midnight cry, right? So it represents that symbol. Okay, any other thoughts on uh, Hadassah.
Okay, her name means Myrtle. Now, of course, with the 1919 Bible Conference, what is, um, yeah, so the Metonic Cycle, the 19's Metonic Cycle. Um, but if we deal with the 1919 Bible Conference, what would that symbol just represent in, in our time? Because what's the issue of the 1919 Bible Conference? Adventism struggling fundamentalism. Okay, so it's basically how do we look at inspiration? Uh, would we say that's the, the simplest way to uh, address the 1919 Bible Conference? I mean, we have the books of a new order. It's going to be start of uh, the third generation. Um, now, remember that that they're still in Babylon, right? I mean, technically, they're in Persia. But they've been taken captive, right? As, as it's noted here, Mordecai was carried away from Jerusalem in the captivity, the same one that Jehoiachin was taken away in, the same one Ezekiel was taken away in by Nebuchadnezzar. So this is still part of the Babylonian captivity. Now they're in Persia because Persia con has conquered Babylon. And so I don't know if they, you know, they just moved over there possibly into that area, uh, but they're not in Jerusalem. Now, part of the, the, the problem with this story, if you look at Mordecai and, and Esther, I mean, they're in captivity. Should they be in captivity? Oh, no. No, they shouldn't. Are Seventh-day Adventists in captivity to Babylon? Yeah. yeah. Should they be in captivity? Nope. And would the 1919 Bible Conference be part of that captivity? Yeah, it'd be the beginning of it. That's why I always found it was odd when people would say, well, the Seventh-day Adventist church is not Babylon, because that's pretty obvious that it's not Babylon. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the issue. The issue is, are we in Babylon? Right? Yeah. Not is the Seventh-day Adventist church in Babylon, but is the Seventh-day Adventist church in captivity to Babylon? Exactly. Has the church been taken captive? Spiritual captivity. Right. right. And that would have to do with the way that the Protestants who are Babylon, who become part of Babylon, have conquered Adventism. And they did that um, really specifically, if you want to place it that way, in the third generation, in that history from 1919 uh, to 1957. Right. So we have Adventists um, from 1888 to 1919, they've rejected the third angel's message. So when they get to 1919, uh, they now are in captivity, right? So they, they never came out of Babylon. They're still in Babylon. And so even though Esther is, you know, even though she's, she's bad in a sense, right? Everything that she's doing is kind of bad. She's symbolizing though a message that is going to bring us out of Babylon that is going to deliver us at the Sunday law. So on, on the broader scale of things, if we look at, at Esther, the story of Esther is going to relate to the Sunday law. That's the Sunday law that's coming, right? It's still something future. But we can look at symbols here in this story that relate specifically to our message at the present time. And of course, one of the things about our message is that Trump is Xerxes. Is that Esther chapter one represents, you know, Trump in this his initial phase, let's say. And then when we go from Esther chapter two onward, that this would represent the Sunday law future. And again, Trump would be Xerxes. That would be one way that this could be interpreted, right? 
I'm not saying it's the right way, I'm not saying it's the wrong way. I'm just saying that it is a way that a person could look at it. They could say, well, sure, Trump was defeated by the globalists, but then he's going to um, come back and it's going to be suggested that he takes a wife. And this wife is going to end up being Esther, whatever that would mean symbolically. Uh, um, uh, so it answers just in the chat answering the question yes and no dealing with uh, about should we be in captivity or are we in captivity we shouldn't wouldn't be in captivity had we consistently heeded God's conditions yes so so we're in captivity because of disobedience so we have Hadassah that's mentioned now, um, which is Esther. That is Esther, right? So she's going to have a Persian name that's given to her, but her Hebrew name is Hadassah, which means Myrtle, Esther, Aster. It's, it's a star. It's a Persian name. Um, we live in Aster clothes, right? So that's related to the word. Aster, aster, of course, is a flower that's a starlight flower. That's why it's called an aster. But anyway, um, so this is his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So she's adopted by Mordecai. And it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together, on Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the keeper, to the custody, custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification, with which, with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place uh, of the women and esther had not showed her people nor her kindred for mordecai had charged her that she should not show it so he doesn't know that she's a jew right that's not being revealed now mordecai walked every day before the court of the woman's house to know how esther did and what should become of her and when every maid's turn was come to go into king ahasuerus after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished to wit six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. Is it Mordecai, Esther's husband, or uncle, sorry? Yeah, what about him? Just making sure. Yeah, well, he's, he's a cousin. Cousin? Yeah. And then thus came every maiden into the king, and whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the woman unto the king's house. And in the evening she went, on the morrow she returned unto the second house of the women, to the custody of Shagaz, king, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. And she came unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she recalled by name. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abigail, the uncle of Mordecai, who, who had taken um, her for his daughter, was come to go into unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the woman, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, into his house royal in the 10th month, which is the month Tebet in the seventh year of his reign. So we have that 10th day of the seventh month symbol, even though it's the 10th month, seventh year, but we still have that 10 and seven together. But also it's in uh, 2 verse 16. So again, 216 is uh, six times six times six. Um, so that symbol relates to the Sunday law. So so we have different parts in the book of Esther. So here in this story, the story of the marriage, 
we we separate it from the story uh, when she when the decree happens. So we have the story of Vashti, and then we have the story of Esther. So Vashti was queen; she's no longer queen. And then we're going to have Esther, this story, and and Esther becomes queen in the stead of Vashti. So what is and, and we see that also in 21.7, the, the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Ashdod. So we have the 216 symbol, the 666 symbol, with the 10th day, 7th month symbol, and then we have the marriage itself, where she's made queen, and that's going to be in the symbol that's July 21st. It's 217. And I don't know whether we could draw these things on lines or how we would address this. But if we take, if we take this story, can we place this story as parallel with the story of Ashdai or as a line that follows the story of Vashti. If you understand what I'm asking. Because when we, we studied the book of Esther, we weren't really drawing everything on a line. So if we were going to draw a line, would we have a line for chapter one and then another line for chapter two? that parallels, parallels uh, chapter one, or would we have a line that has chapter one and chapter two? That is, would chapter one be the first angel's message and chapter two be the second angel's message? Or would we do both? I mean, because obviously you could take any waymark and zoom into it and create a line, even if even if it was the case. But if we're putting this into our history, how would we take this story of Vashti and Esther? How would we place it in our history? Guys need to be more helpful. Okay, well, so Angela says Vashti fades from the scenes and Esther rises, a new line, and then she puts a question. 1989. Okay. In this situation, mm -hmm. when when I was led to do that study on Esther, mm -hmm. the point that I came away with after combining what's in the King James and what's in the Apocrypha mm -hmm. was that Mordecai is representative of the other angel of Revelation 18. Esther and her handmaidens each represent in order the third, second, and first angel's messages of Revelation 14. Well, so in, we, we did apply it, though, once we got to the story of the decree. But in this story of chapter 2, 
we don't we don't have that right that is we're going to have another line again so you understand what i'm what i'm saying here what i'm what i'm referring to yeah regarding this situation with bash time mm -hmm. if esther is representing the true understanding then bash time must be representing the false understanding. Yeah, well, this is the, the position that Jeff took, right? So right. Now, now, in the initial application that Jeff had of the book of Esther, he had Xerxes representing Christ. Right? I, I recall that he did that, yes. Okay. So, so you had Xerxes representing Christ, and, and basically it was the story of two churches, you know, a church that rejected, and then a, a new church. That, I mean, that's just a really simple representation of it, right? That is a church that is called um, to replace the other church. I don't know if, I don't know if that's the best way to explain it. But the women represent a church, and Vashti is a church that's rejected, and Esther is a church that's accepted. And it was in 2015 that they were studying this in the fall. And um, all I know, because I wasn't there at the camp meeting in 2015, but I knew that there was a group of people that left the movement, left the camp meeting, because they couldn't take the moral aspects of the story and um, separate it from the symbols. That is, they looked at Vashti as being good, and Jeff is saying Vashti is symbolically bad, and that Esther, they looked at as what she's doing is wrong morally, uh, but symbolically what she's doing is good. And, and they just couldn't get wrap their heads around that, and so... So they left the camp meeting. That's my understanding. At least that's what Jeff said. So I wasn't there. I can't testify of it firsthand. But um, even when you say, you know, Xerxes represents Christ um, and, and his rejection of one church and then his acceptance of another church, um, you know, Xerxes is a pagan king. Right. There isn't anything particularly, um, you know, Christ like about him other than, you know, his his position as king. And that way he could represent Christ. <clears throat> yeah. So we, we talked about that before. There's sort of a moral irony when it comes to these stories. That is, we don't look at the moral aspects of the story to understand the symbols and apply them. Right. Okay, now it's not my desire to have a conflict regarding something that Elder Jeff had presented. Mm -hmm. Yet, if Esther is representative of a message, which we, I think we can establish, and yes, I recognize the fact that here in this chapter of Esther, we have not yet established this point. Right. But Mordecai, excuse, I'm sorry, Xer, um, or Xerxes would then be more representative of those that have not heard the message of the third angel and the introduction of this through Esther would be something that is to go to all the it's eventually to go to all the world but it first has to come to the church yeah well okay um
Well, that's definitely possible. I mean, the thing about Xerxes is we have him representing Trump. Right? So I don't think what Jeff presented was wrong. I think you can take the story and you can make that application of it. But I don't think that that's how we should look at this story of Xerxes. That is, we shouldn't see him as Christ. That's should, my point. Yeah. So in this story, um, Xerxes represents Trump. That's the way that, that's why we're looking at this story. We're saying, we said Xerxes was Trump. Now, back in 2015, Jeff wasn't saying that, right? That's going to come later. And And often what happened in this movement is we kept moving forward with new light, but never having enough time to process what things meant. That is, we, we tended to keep jumping to new things all the time. Now, my nature is such that I tended to stay in the past. That is, when we were studying something new, I was always concerned how it affected what we said before. Right. So that's just my nature. I, every, I, I don't like loose ends. We said something, we started st studying something, and, you know, and then we move on to something new that we haven't finished this thing. So I would keep looking at, at that stuff that we had already studied. Um, so I'd, in a sense, be behind. But sometimes being behind helped me to be a little bit ahead, if that makes sense. It is... I saw, based on what I was studying in the context of what was happening, what we had studied before, and then I would, I'd have this sense, well, this is really important, but we forgot what we were talking about before and how it relates. I mean, that's the whole reason why um, all of that stuff dealing with the Babylonian uh, captivity that I was still studying after, because we studied it in context of these Persian kings, but I kept studying it, right? Um, but anyway, the point is that what we what we need to do in going back and examining what was laid, we can see not that Jeff was wrong, but if Trump is Xerxes, we would still at least have to examine this story in that context. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, again, Jeff was right in the application he was making. But they didn't really finish the book of Esther, right? No, they, they didn't. didn't. They didn't have the whole thing all tied together. They really addressed mostly these first two chapters. That was especially in 2015. Now, we know that this decree is a type of the Sunday law. Um, but, and the problem that I have, that I've had this whole time, ever since we have the line of the three decrees, is that the story of Esther is within the second angel's message itself, that it's in that time from the second decree to the third. And we always have the Sunday law is the arrival of the third is the Sunday law. So if we line it up with Millerite history, um, which we haven't, you know, Jeff never did. Jeff never um, completed those things. He never went through, drew the line of the decrees, drew the line of Millerite history in the context of all of the light that came about Millerite history. Because they had originally done it, you know, earlier on, but that was before we even had the midnight cry, let alone midnight so, so we, we never have had this line completed. And I've drawn it different ways at different times trying to understand the three decrees. But this story of Esther, anyway, the point is it doesn't come at the third message. It comes between the second and third decree. And so my position, which I've taken, whether it's right or wrong, is that this represents... This movement, because we are a movement that's in the second angel's message. We're after 
right? Presently. And we're involved in this second angel's message. And we are going to be proclaiming at midnight in a midnight cry, the second angel's message to Adventists to the world, right? Prior to the Sunday law itself. That's the message that's being developed. So, um, if this is Xerxes, so we're going to take Xerxes here. So just to go back, we say Xerxes is stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. Esther chapter one would have to refer to Trump prior to the defeat of January 6th, 2021. <coughs> so the question is, where do we place Esther chapter two? Is it a repeat of that history? Is it a parallel? Or is it the second angel's message in that context? That is, if we draw this on a line, can we say the first angel is Esther chapter one, the second angel is Esther chapter two, and that both refer to Xerxes, Xerxes in two different contexts, the first message and the second message. And if we did, how would we do that? Or do we take them as parallel in, in our primary way of looking at them? And then we're going to have, of course, the story. You know, so this is taking us a bit more time than I wanted. But, you know, once we have Haman's plot against the Jews, uh, we, we could take Esther chapter 1 is the first angel. Esther chapter 2 is the second angel. Esther, Esther chapter 3 is the third angel. We could do that. Because this is going to be the Sunday law, right? Which is the third angel. So it's going to be the Sunday law with all the decree and everything. Uh, but then there's a bunch to this story. So we could say, well, what is the rest of this story? I mean, it's, it's still going to be about the Sunday law. But there's... There is a repeat of history here that has to do with, and that's how we looked at it before, is that we have this story of these feasts, right? So in this story of the feasts, we're going to have... Um, guess how many feasts are there? There's the two banquets, the one on the 16th, the one on the 17th. How did we do that? I'm trying to remember. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that we're probably going to have to spend a bit more time on this than I want to. I don't really want to do Esther again. Right, because we're going to have this... Um, This decree on the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th year, right? That this decree goes into effect. March 7th. 13 times 12 times 12 is 1872. Um, and we asked some questions about March 7th yesterday, March 7th, 2021. And its relation to March 7th um, in uh, when you hear this March 7th in 740, 7, 473. So you got 473 BC and you have 321. That's 793 years apart. You connected that to uh, that extra part of the day. So 
A month is 29 and a half days plus 793 parts. 793 parts is 2,640 seconds. which is 44 minutes and um, exactly. And then you have the th one part, the three and a third seconds. So a month is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, three and a third seconds. That's the length of a month. So how do we relate all of that? So we have these We have these symbols and we can tie them to our history, right? When I say our history, I mean our history that we're in right now. So if we take our history as being typical of something that's going to happen, Right. Because this is this is the view that I have, that everything that we've we've experienced in this movement, the repetition of the first and second angels messages, the disappointment, um, all of all of the predictions, all of the dates, all of this symbolism. This is is meant to be typical of something that's going to happen. It's not the actual thing. When I'm not sure why God puts us through this typical history, other than I know that we've been in it. So how, how are we going to approach drawing all of this out? And how are we going to address the, the chapters following? So if we're going to say, um, you know, Chapter one's the first. Can we agree that chapter one is the first, chapter two is the second, and chapter three is the third angel? We have the same thing in the book of Daniel. Chapter one's the first angel's message, chapter two is the second, and chapter three is the third. Right? You can definitely see the Sunday law here. Yeah. So Okay. And this is particularly what uh, Colin is saying. Daniel chapter three is the Sunday law. So can we take this? Can we just take the story of Esther and say it has that same structure? There's other other books that do this as well. So first, second, and third. I'll put to Ezra for some reason instead of Esther. Then we go here. So this first, second, and third angels' messages. And then the fourth is a repeat of that. Now, so one of the issues here is we have Xerxes all through this. But, you know, if we say that Xerxes is Trump, we can take the story dealing with this deception that Haman brings upon Xerxes as something that's either happened or going to happen. Now, if the Protestants are going to lead Trump to give a Sunday law, right, because that's really the suggestion. The suggestion is that even though Trump's a constitutionalist, even though, you know, he's not a tyrant, once he gets back into power, he's going to then be deceived and he's going to sign the Sunday law, even though it's not something he would, would naturally do. That's the suggestion. That's, that's Colin's suggestion in, in a sort of a simple way. Right? Trump has to come back into power. Right, because Trump is in this Sunday law history. Now, 
let's let's think a little bit further. So if we take this parallel between Daniel and and there is strong parallels between Daniel 1, 2, and 3, and Esther 1, 2, and 3. What are some of the obvious parallels? Well, they're both in the king's palace. Right, so they're both in Esther and Daniel. Yeah, so we're, we're going to have a similar type of story in these chapters where, you know, Daniel is going to be He's a man, right? And he's going to be made a uh, um, um, you know a a leader, right? Can't think yeah. of the word. But he's going to be appointed, you know, he's going to become an astrologer, you know, Chaldean, right? He's then getting he, the then he, uh, he also saves saves the Hebrews, fellow Hebrews from being yeah. killed. Yeah, so he's going to be a statesman, and then he's going to keep people from from being killed. Um, you know, so we have some similar aspects, and and critics are always like, "Well, see, these stories have a lot of similarities, so they're just it's just some kind of a story device, you know. So we shouldn't take it really seriously. These are just uh, literary devices; they they're just following a pattern, and these are all written in the second century BC." Um, you know, not written in the times in which it's attributed to them. Um, but we can see that the fact that there's similarities to these stories. Uh, yeah, we have the Unix connection. Um, so there's a bunch of Unix. Um, I'm just trying to think. So, and in Esther chapter one, we have well let's let's look at Daniel chapter one again. So in Daniel chapter one, the first thing that we see is it's in the third year of Jehoiakim. So this is going to be the father of Jehoiachin, that Daniel's taken captive. But Daniel's taken captive by Babylon, right? And this story is addressing Babylon. Uh, the king that's going to be affected is Nebuchadnezzar. So in this history, in the history of Babylon, we have a story that's going to uh, illustrate something parallel to the story of Esther. But instead of being Persia, it's going to be Babylon. Right? And we all know that the story in chapter 3 of, of Daniel is a type of the Sunday law. Right. Ellen White clearly has marked that to be the case. So we have um, a Babylonian captivity. Now, it's true also Mordecai. That he's he he's connected to the Babylonian captivity, but not with Jehoiakim, but with Jehoiachin through his father. So his father is taken captive in the time of Jehoiachin. So that's going to be 10 years after Daniel's taken captive. And Mordecai is going to be in, in Persia, right? So that story is going to relate to Persia. So in Babylon, we have a story that typifies the Sunday law. And in Persia, we have a story that typifies the Sunday law. Now, what about the whole story of the feasts that, that are going to occur in Esther chapter 1? Is there anything that we can do to parallel Esther chapter one with Daniel chapter one? Because this is going to be this test, the 10 days test, and then the three years that's. Um, Right. <clears throat> so can we parallel this in what ways? Can we parallel this? Daniel chapter one.
I mean, they're quite different stories, the, the first chapters. Because if we're saying they're the first angel's message, how is Daniel chapter 1 illustrating the first angel's message? And how is Esther chapter 1 illustrating the first angel's message? And from what perspective and what are the symbols? Okay, so we're going to get the sampling of the maidens. That's going to be in chapter two, right? So I just want to deal with chapter chapter one. So it's in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, right? In Esther chapter one, in the third year of the reign of Xerxes. So why this symbol of the third year? How does that relate? I mean, they both have a third year of a king. Now, one is is a king Jehoiakim, who's he's not Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's he's the king of Judah. But they both have the third year of a king mentioned. So, what is that symbol? What did I say it was yesterday when it came to the story of Esther? Uh, was it the third angel? Okay, well, I didn't have it as the third angel. Um. I relate because we, we dealt with the we dealt with the third as the third day, right? We did lots of studies about the third day. Right. And we have it in the story of of Ezra, we have all these periods of three days. And so we addressed it as the third year of uh Trump, right? But what is the symbol of the third year then? What is it marked? Or was it the, the three days of prediction before midnight? Okay, so the three days before midnight, the prediction before midnight, that three day symbol. So it ties us to that. So again, it would tie us to our history. Um, so we have that symbol because. The prediction before midnight represents the three years, um, at least 2019, 2020, and 2021. That it relates to that history in this movement. So, so if we're going to say that this is the first angel's message, it's the first angel's message in our history. So uh, the vessels of the house of God being carried away to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So the vessels are going to be taken. Now we know, of course, he's going to take all of these young men as well. But one of the things it talks about is these vessels of the house of God are being taken captive. Now, these are going to be returned, you know, at the time when Cyrus makes his decree. And we know that more vessels are going to be taken later on as well when uh, uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. Now we have these children who are taken captive and they're meant to be taught the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. But 
But Daniel and his three friends are going to reject uh, the food that's provided. Now, they're also, in a sense, rejecting the knowledge. Even though they are skilled in all of this knowledge, their primary knowledge is their connection with God. And they're going to be renamed, right? So here we're going to have Daniel and his three friends. Daniel's name is going to be changed to Belteshazzar, Hananiah to Shadrach, Mishael to Meshach, and Azariah to Abednego. Okay, so Esther has two names as well. But that's going to be chapter two that we get Esther, but it's but it's still part of that those stories. Now what about is there any way in which we could um because we have the story of Vashti, so we're saying that there's two different churches, one that's um not obedient and the next one that is in the story of Esther and in the story of Daniel. What other parallels do we So here Daniel and his friends are going to be brought in before Nebuchadnezzar, just like they want to bring in Vashti. But here they're going to be examined. Now then chapter two, there's going to be this interpretation of a dream. So we're saying this, Jeff is saying, this is the second angel's message. And then you have the third angel's message, which is the Sunday law. Okay. So we have, I should say that these are all parallel. I don't know whether we should draw them out on lines, whether we should just take a mental note about, about this. Any comments about what we're discussing here? Uh, is this any thoughts, any questions? Okay, so when we go to Esther chapter 4, we're going to have this whole um, repeat of history, if we want to say it that way, right? Because we're saying the first, second, and third chapters of the first, second, and third angel's message. And then we have the rest of the book of Esther. This is going to be, uh, you know, Esther's going to agree to help the Jews, right? There's going to be all this uh, preparation, this planning of what they're going to do. All right, so she's going to make that decision in chapter four, in chapter five, and, and she's going to have that fast. And then on the third day of that fast, she's going to go in between before Xerxes, right? She puts on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. It was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. 
and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So when she goes to see um, Xerxes, what is the whole illustration here of her being accepted? Is this an illustration of the gospel? It would have to be. Okay. So what's it illustrating? How is it illustrating it? So we know she puts on her royal apparel, right? This is Xerxes representing God in some way, right? She goes in, she's accepted. It's like the examination of the wedding garment sort of thing in Christ's parables. So, and, and that's often understood that way, that there's some symbolism here. But in this story, she's going to make a request about a banquet, banquet, right? So, so this is on the third day. The third day from what? I mean, it's the third day of the fast, but from what date? So remember, the decree is given on the 13th day of the first month. So if we go back in this story, right, there's going to be this plot. Uh, let me see, where is it here? Um, that's going to be something else. Uh, Haman's plot against the Jews. Okay, so they're going to cast these lots in the first month, that is the month in the sun on the 12th year of the king, Ahasuerus. King Ahasuerus or Xerxes, they cast Pur, that is lots, uh, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the 12th month, that is the month Adar. So that means they didn't go every day and cast lots. They're casting for these things. So they're going to figure out which day by casting lots and which month. So I'm not sure exactly how they do that, whether they they say, okay, for this day, we cast lots. Let's see if the lots accept this day. But anyway, they're going to find that it's the 13th day, and then the month is going to be the 12th month. And so they decide that that's the auspicious day in which to kill the Jews. Right? That's what happens. Because originally when they studied this, they had discussion on like how about how did they do this? But that was the conclusion is that they just did this all at once. And they're going to begin this um, at the beginning of the year, right? So this is going to be in the month Nisan. They're going to start casting lots. They're going to cast these lots. They're going to pick the 13th day of the 12th month. And so, so Haman said unto King Xerxes, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom and their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. But if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed 
and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have charge of the king of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and the Jew's enemy. The Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, Silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. <clears throat> and the king, uh, let me see. And then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month. And there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province. So this is going to be issued on the 13th day of the first month. Right. So that's when the decree is given. OK, so. Uh, now, Esther is going to find out about this or Mordecai is going to find out about this. When. So they're going to send out these letters, a copy of the writing was commandments to give into every province and the posts went out. Right. They're going to send this. Um, and then it says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street, of the city which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he, he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, right? So you go through this whole story here. Um, and See here, all the king's servants and the people of the kings, 13 days and 12 months from the Trump addiction until his first day in office. Yeah. So what is that, Stephen, you're saying? You're saying from when we made the Trump prediction, it was 13 days and 12 months until his first day in office? So the Trump prediction was given on... Yes, that, that was on the... 9th of January, 2016. Okay. So that's an interesting point. So, um, so we say on, in 2016, so if we go from the 9th of January, um, So when you're counting that year, now Trump is put in office, what, January? Well, saying, his inauguration was on the 20th, but his first day in office is the 21st. The 20th. Yeah, so it would be 13 days, 12 months, inclusive. Yeah, so an inclusive count of days. Okay. Okay, interesting. And... Uh, so that Trump prediction is made. Um, 9th of January. Yeah, so that's on the Sabbath. Is the, that's at Lambert Church, I guess. The yes. Jeff presentation. So it was a, a, a sermon entitled A Certain Sound. Okay. So connects to like a trumpet. So you have to name. Trump then as well, sort of connects with Trump. And uh, Trump was seven years, seven months, and seven days old. Okay. On that day. 
Okay. Yeah. So seventh day, seven, 70 years, seven months, and seven days? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because he's born on June 14th? 1946. Yeah, 1946. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So we got a 777 attached to this prediction. Okay, so that, that's helpful. So we can see um, this 13th day of the 12th month uh, is, is an important symbol. Now, um, so it says, go gather together all the Jews that are present. This is verse 16 of chapter 4. And fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days. Night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so I will go in unto the king, which which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Of course, we have that doubling, the perish, perish. And then, um, so this is going to be on the 14th that she begins her fasting. Would we agree with that? So the decree is issued on the 13th day of the first month, but she's going to begin her fasting on the Feast of Passover. Okay, and we know that this is in uh, the 12th year of Xerxes' reign, right? That date, uh, 14th day of the first month. And so when she goes in before the king, what date would it be? Do people agree with me that she begins to fast on the 14th day of the first month and that she's going to go in before the king on the 16th day of the first month, on the third day of the fast? Three days, night and day. But, but that's an expression. She's not going to fast for 72 hours. Why wouldn't she fast for three days, 72 hours? Well, because it says it's on the third day that she's going to stand before the king. So if it's on the third day, that's an ordinal count. And so if she fasted three days, the third day, it can't be, it can't be 72 hours. That'd be the fourth day. We have the same situation with Christ. 
He's not in the grave for 72 hours. He's crucified on the 14th and he's resurrected on the 16th. And I'm arguing that this is the same period of time for when she begins to fast to when she appears before the king. That the expression three days, night and day, or three days and three nights does not constitute a 72 hour period. It's just an idiomatic expression. We would normally call it two days. So my view is on the 13th, she finds out about this. They're going to start fasting on the 14th. That is on the 14th, they're not going to eat anything. And they're not going to eat anything on the 15th. But on the 16th, she's going to appear before Xerxes. That's going to be the third day of the fast. Anybody disagree or comment on it or question? So she's going to fast from the Passover to the wave offering. <clears throat> do we do we agree? I hadn't considered it before, but your point is logical. Okay. Well, we had studied it before. We did discuss it before, but you might not have remembered. Yeah. So, so this is the point. It, it's logical, right? Based upon what we know, and and this would be typical, right? That fourteenth to the sixteenth. We see that um, in other stories and other histories. But especially in the time of Christ, which is the primary one. Okay. So, so we have that. We're going to have to finish here pretty soon. But um, then, then we're gonna, if you go through the story, that Mordecai is honored and Haman is hanged. Okay. Now we have um, we're going to have another decree in Esther as well. So in chapter eight, are we? going to be able to cover this in detail since we have less than a minute remaining today no 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 we're not going to be able to so so we're going to have to look at this so the point is that um we have another decree this is the counter decree we have to figure out what that means right so there's going to be this counter decree that's going to happen and and that's going to occur um, on the 23rd day of the third month in the 12th year of, of Xerxes, uh, June 25th, it's going to happen 200 and, uh, 256 days before the decree goes into effect, before Haman's decree goes into effect. So we're going to look at that. And, um, and from, uh, yeah, so we'll look at that tomorrow. And, any final questions for today? So I know that we're moving slowly. We've gone through this book before, but we don't remember all of it. And obviously we have more light now in order to understand it. Okay, let's pray. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you got some comments, Stephen? Well, I was just going to ask, where, where is it that it says about the, the thir you said the 13th day of the first month? Or first month? On the 13th day of the first month is when they issue the decree, right? Okay. And what verse is that? 
Um, that is in chapter three. Uh, says uh, three verse seven in the first month that is the month nisan in the 12th year of the king ahasuerus they cast uh per that is the lot before haman right and then it's going to say um uh 13th it's going to say where is it here Yeah, uh, 13 verse 12. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants. So the decree is issued on the 13th day of the first month. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your spirit to be with us throughout this day, and thank you for the time that we've had this morning. May your Holy Spirit continue to teach us and lead us. Bless each person searching for truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.